Hello to you all and welcome to the Pitcast by us here at the Pit Crew Online. From the fans, for the fans. In this instalment of the Pitcast, we are talking about sim racing. In anticipation of real world racing getting back underway, we are going to be discussing the good, the bad and the ugly that has come out of the esports races that have taken place since the Australian Grand Prix was cancelled. This weekend will probably be the pinnacle of all the sim racing so far with the virtual 24 hours of Le Mans. And if you've seen my article on it, you will know why. Anyway, let's go on with it today and bring you up to speed with who we have here today. So as ever, my name is Luca, I am your host. And in this installment, I'm joined by three first timers to the Pitcast, but three very more experienced people than me in terms of how long they've been on the crew on the Pit Crew website. So I hope you will all be ready to give give these people a big introduction, a big hand, and uh, if all three of you are ready to give your backgrounds uh, in as part of the pit crew. So firstly, we have our Formula E editor, Sarah. Hi, um, I've been part of the pit crew since 2017. Um, I've covered various Formula E events in Europe, um, including testing and um, I'm really, really enjoying having my first time on the podcast. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Well, next up is Aaron, who is our BTCC editor, but has also edited, edited the first in two installments of the podcast. Uh, thank you for that, Aaron. Uh, no probs. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm probably one of the old timers now. I've been on the pit crew since 2015. So I've um, been here a while, done a whole host of stuff while I've been here. Um, on the subject of sim racing, I did also uh, work with Virtual GP, a uh, Czech racing series that we're in partnership with. I sort of ran that for the first couple of uh, seasons. Nice. Well, okay. Next up, our last um, member with us today is our senior Formula One correspondent, Rob. Hi everybody, uh, I've been part of the crew for two years now, I've uh, been covering Formula One, been uh, doing race previews for example and a couple of uh, couple of commentaries as well, also for Le Mans which is uh, coming, coming up virtually this weekend and uh, in February got my first interview uh, with uh, Martin Stefanko who is uh, a Formula One or former Formula One esports driver, um, so uh, not had too much experience but uh, a decent amount so far. Right, well I know I'm happy to be talking about sim racing because this is kind of like my thing as well. So when I joined the pit crew a few months ago, it was literally on the cusp of this sim racing explosion that we've had. I have praised sim racing for years personally. I wrote articles on two drivers who have helped their sim racing has helped their forays into real racing being Igor Fraga and James Baldwin. And now we have so much to talk about right now uh, that it's, it's, it's incredible. So, um, firstly, let's talk about, um, well, the, a lot of the events that were going on at first in place of the real races. So we had like uh, the race putting on their own all-star series. We had Veloce putting on not the GP, F1 then hurried together to, co- to create their own virtual Grand Prix series. Uh, there has been so much going on. And uh, Rob, I'll throw it over to you first. Um, what, what have you been making of the sim races so far, considering that you have got a bit of a hand in sim racing yourself? I think it's been fantastic. I think for a couple of years now already, kind of, we saw like 2016, 2017, it was already kind of making its appearance. Um, we saw the first uh, first ever F1 esports uh, series in, in F1 2017, which was a massive thing for Formula One and also for, for esports in general. So it, it had been in an upwards curve, I think, for a couple of years before. But now, obviously, with, uh, with, with the lockdown, it's kind of given rise um, to a real kind of explosion in um, in in the success of, of F1 esports and, and kind of motorsports esports in general. So uh, I think it's been a, a fantastic last few months. So I think that it's definitely been a silver lining, um, you know, with the fact that now it kind of brings the racing much closer to us than it's ever been before um you know we've got streamers you know like formula one drivers and, and drivers from all around the world of, of motorsport streaming and uh, youtube is getting involved and uh, it's been a fantastic last few months to enjoy it and obviously we've all been able to watch it for free on youtube as well so i think it's been absolutely fantastic so far and i've really enjoyed it and i think even when racing gets underway again uh, i think it's somewhere or other this will continue to to be a a large kind of pattern going forward in in, in motorsports and i'm really looking forward to it 
Yeah, me too. And uh, Aaron, I'm going to throw this over to you. I want to ask you about how incredibly relatable a lot of um, this time has really been because uh, we we sort of saw in it initially with uh, the potential of how these drivers could really uh, be in terms of how they represent themselves through Twitch stream by Lando Norris, who was like the first driver to really put his foot in the door in regards to, you know, Twitch streaming and sim racing. And now so many people have followed in, in his footsteps and it's kind of caused, I think, it, as mo I think this is the best thing to happen to motorsport. Okay, that's probably quite morbid considering it's because of the bloody virus. I don't mean it like that. Um, but in terms of, in terms of how much it's really helped improve the brand of motor racing, uh, the idea of having these drivers, you got a camera right there and on their wheels and seeing their reactions and how they engage with their viewers, it's probably been the best thing to happen to F1 since Drive to Survive on Netflix. Yeah, I mean, like I said, sim racing is, it's, you know, like Rob said, it's brought us closer to the racing um, and it's let us see the drivers' personalities a bit more, you know, um, it's let us see a bit more of what Lando Norris, Charles Leclerc, what they all do in the space and what they do in their spare time. You know, they all have a joke, play different games like Lando's been playing Call of Duty with some big names recently. Um, but it's also give us a chance to see some of the more niche um, sim racers on YouTube, you know, like Jimmy Broadbent, Super GT. It's let us sort of be exposed to them, you know. I mean, some people watched them already and, um, you know, were aware of them, but now it's become a lot more mainstream. Sim racing in general, I mean, we've had all kinds of celebrities in these, not the GP uh, races, you know, like um, Man City players, uh, Sergio Aguero, Emmerich Laporte, you know them kind of people, people you wouldn't even expect to be interested in motorsport in F1 in general. So, you know, it's, I think it's certainly been a good thing that uh, sim racing's filled the gap while we've all been sat waiting for this virus to be over. Yeah, well, uh, Sarah, I'm going to throw this one over to you. Um, there has been some bad to have come out of uh, sim racing as well, a lot of real world consequences. So, uh, uh, Sarah, here's the Formula E editor, if you've been following the Formula E. Uh, race at home challenge you probably don't want about to talk about but you've um we've had instances where real world drivers have actually had to um have punishments and consequences laid against them uh for doing ill stuff uh, so for example we've had those two instances in nascar where one of them lost a sponsorship and another dropped a naughty word on twitch stream then you got an indy car lando norris got took out by simon paginal because he's salty um and then what i'm about to ask you here Daniel Apt um, lost his Audi drive because of his actions where he got a sim racer to race in his place. Yeah, so obviously um, I'm assuming that most people have watched the video and they knew um, what his intentions ended up being, which was that it was a prank gone wrong. Um, the only problem is that eSports has always been quite prevalent within Formula E. We've always had esports an esports event at every single race that's that's happened but then you've got the problem of is it serving the purpose of is it serving a purpose of being a sort of too sorry that's <laughs> no, okay it's okay <laughs> um it's the problem with it the problem with a sort of situation like this is that it's not reality it's using esports as um, a way to deliver a product that isn't supposed to be virtual. So, do we in turn deliver real punishments? For example, Kyle Larson um, delivered a, ver uh, a, a sorry a awful word. Let's go awful <laughs> yes, word. a naughty word. <laughs> um, obviously, in those circumstances, you can understand that. Racism should not be tolerated in any sort of community. But when it comes to sort of a situation like this, where you're, where it's sort of a very gray area. So it's, it's strange that should we, should we use a virtual world to deliver real punishments? Because a driver has lost their job at the end of the day over something that possibly couldn't have happened had, a virtu had this virtual race not occurred. Well, I, I want to bring you back to that point because um, a couple of, right when it happened, there was a guy on Twitter called David Deva, um, and we were comparing the um, 
the incidents with Simon Paginot and then Santino Ferrucci in that Indy 175 iRace and Challenge event to what Daniel App did uh, in the Race at Home Challenge. And uh, David the Deva replied to me on Twitter saying, Paginot and Ferrucci behaved badly. Poor sportsmen, however, being an asshat is not nearly the same as what Apt did. Yeah, that, those were his words. Um, as what Apt did. Word, Mis- I love that word. Yep. <laughs> Misrepresenting himself <laughs> to everyone because he was cheating and his obligations to be the guy behind the monitor were shirked. He lied to everyone in an official appearance. And that does bring up the point of, like, even though it's actually Daniel App's own family name that's the team and they are backed by Audi's factory efforts. Even that couldn't save him because like, yeah, he was behaving like not, not on the level of what Ferrucci and uh, Pagano did, but this is an official brand, which is trying to, it's part of the Volkswagen group, isn't it? And they are trying to sit in the skin after the emissions scandal a few years ago as well. So they can't really, be shown to be involved in any kind of tomfoolery. Yes, I mean they've got the uh, the diesel gate scandal is still going on um, at this moment. Um, there's a lot of legal obligations that they're trying to fulfil, and the app's name has always been synonymous with Audi, um, even throughout the start of Formula E. Um, the prob the problem is, like you say, um, Audi are a international brand. They have to fulfil their contracts. They can't be seen to be supporting drivers that may or may not have um, done the things they did, um, whether it be virtual or non-virtual. Because if he'd done this in a real race, then he'd be out of the door faster than you could say um, IndyCar. Um, but the the um, it's it's a strange situation because y- y- I don't think Audi can win either way because they're going to be tarred with this brush of having a driver that's cheated on a sim race. And if they, if they don't get rid of him, then there seem to be a cheating team. And if they do get rid of him, then they're the bad guys. So they can't win either way. Yeah, it was, it's like a case of when the BBC had to fire Jeremy Clarkson because if they renewed his contract. It looked like they were trying to renew the contract of someone who punched, assaulted a producer. So they were going to lose either way, even though it was like their biggest asset at that time. And um, I, I just do want to say, though, like the idea of having someone like race for you. Um, imagine uh, in MotoGP, like the motorcycles, uh, there's, there's twins, isn't there? There's Sam and Alex Laws. Imagine if they rode for each other at one point. That would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Right, um, Aaron, I'm going to throw this back to you. Uh, this has obviously been a, a very problematic aspect of sim racing, but... I do want to touch upon the fact that something I've believed in for many years is that the lines really are being blurred because motorsport in and of itself is hugely expensive. And the fact is, is that sim racing has allowed for an inexpensive way of showcasing ability. Uh, Like in a sense of, you've got James Baldwin, the world's fastest gamer. He He had to quit racing karts, but then he enters into world's fastest gamer wins that and now he's going to be racing for Jensen Button's GT team in the World Challenge events. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like you say, it's blaring the lines. I mean, anyone can, you know, because it's no secret motor racing is an expensive hobby. You know, you've got to have thousands of pounds just to even get on the grid and never mind be quick. Um, So obviously sometimes these quick drivers don't have a chance to show how quick they can be. But like you say, some people like James Baldwin can you know, show what they can do through sim racing and, you know, give it to the, become a real driver. It's like um, some of the virtual GP guys, uh, Martin Stefanko, he's a real driver now. Um, You know, um, there was even a prize for one of the seasons, I remember. Um, If the one that got a test in a, I think it was an F4 car. So, you know, it is blaring the lines and it can only get better from here. You know, it could go even better than it is now. There could be a point where, I don't know, it just, it, it's all blaring together. It's brilliant. I love it. Yeah, I mean, the fact is, is that because, yeah, racing in and of itself has to um, be expensive and uh, because of like all the parts to like, you know, ship it around, um, put repair the cars, get get team personnel there. The fact is with, with sim racing, you literally just have to buy a, a, a sim uh, hook it up to your TV and your PlayStation or whatever you use and 
it does require still a bit of skill. Uh, you know, you have to like apply the throttle in the same way. Uh, there's obviously no g-force in there, so you can't really apply. Like, it's not it's not going to be completely effective, but it's certainly a hell of a lot closer than I don't know grabbing your controller and and like controlling a player on on the on FIFA or something. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to translate it so well to the real thing. And that's the beauty of it. It is an it is an incredible way of showcasing ability while still not it's not going to replace it that is another thing i want to ask and rob i'm going to throw it over to you for this one real racing has been obviously suspended for a little bit we're thankfully going to be getting underway very soon in fact some series have already started but there were genuinely people that thought that sim racing was going to act as a replacement and what, what would you say to those people I think it's tough. I think we've seen a lot of people say that it's not the real thing. Um, obviously, what you don't experience uh, behind a computer screen or a TV screen is the G-forces that, that uh, real drivers feel when they're actually on track, uh, for example. Um, and I guess the, the pressure, for, even of just being within a team, you know, not necessarily just the physical strain, but also the, the mental strain that they go through on, on track, uh, working with the team, working with mechanical failures, the, the real prominent danger that exists within uh on track racing that doesn't exist within within esports so i think that, i mean i mean that's the reason it's called a simulation because it isn't the real thing it isn't actual on track racing which is what gives you that adrenaline rush you don't get an adrenaline rush really when you're sim racing but you do get it for example if if you go karting you know on the track you just feel on top of the world i think the I remember that quote from Rush when uh, when James Hunt played. Uh, he, he said uh, he said that the closer closer you are to death, the more alive you feel, and that's kind of how it is in in racing. So I think while esports does a good job of semi replicating, you know what what F one drivers and and racing drivers in general go through in terms of com the competitive nature, the physical nature, and to an extent sometimes the the mental nature you can't really replicate that within a game or within a, within a sim. Um, so it isn't quite the same, but it will get more and more realistic. That's for sure. Uh, and it is, uh, I think for, for those of us, like Aaron said, you know, none of us, well, not many of us have the money, sadly, you know, to go and pursue a career in motorsport. Uh, so at the very least, you know, it gets us closer than we ever would have been before um, to, to experiencing that feeling of, of being behind the, the wheel of a, of a race car. Uh, another thing I want to ask you, Rob, is regarding the attitudes behind um, toward sim racing, and because you know you've seen a lot of these drivers who really don't take it seriously, um, and mm. just remark that these organised events are "quote unquote" just a game. Um, and I want to relay a point to Sarah later uh, relating to this, but specifically in regards to how these people see these video games just because yeah no one can get hurt but that doesn't mean that you you're you're permitted to drive in like a buffoon no definitely not because as i said whilst it doesn't replicate the, the physical nature of it it is still competitive um these these esports guys and girls they uh they do this professionally not necessarily as their only job you know they don't they don't get paid the big bucks that the real drivers do maybe in the future perhaps they will be but um for now, you know, they, they do this professionally, they do this competitively. They've spent years and years, you know, practicing on, on F1 games and such like, you know, to try and prepare themselves for what they're doing now, which is racing professionally on, on a sim. So I think to, to go into an official event and mess around and take people out and just not take it seriously, it's massively disrespectful um, to those who, who do it competitively and, and race hard because they have a passion for it and you are you disrespecting and dismerching someone's passion. Uh, if, if you go into an official event like that and start messing around, if it's on a, if it's on a stream, just for example, on one of Charles Leclerc's streams, when he, you know, dresses up as a banana and goes karting uh, on, a, on a, on a lawnmower, that's fine. You can mess about there, but on an official event where there, there's these esports drivers who really are taking this seriously and they really have spent a long time getting to where they are now to mess around like that is very disrespectful to them. And if you're not, gonna, if you're not going to take that seriously, don't be there. Uh, Sarah, the point I wanted to make to you was regarding Formula E's attitude, because from the very beginning, Formula E wanted to integrate an aspect of it where you could be able to actually race these drivers uh, in between qualifying and the race. I think, I believe they 
They use like a, mo a modified version of the mobile game Real Racing 3. They might have changed that the last couple of years, I don't know. But they were able to drive that. I always watched the races and it was a bit of a cluster. You know, these drivers just, they, they don't bother trying to drive normally. But what, what do you think about Formula E's attitude towards the sim racing side? Because that is where the new audience is. Definitely. I mean, um, going back from previous experience of um, going to races, like a lot of the drivers would see it as sort of a unnecessary evil, sort of like a PR appearance to get to get between qualifying and the race, because it would always be between qualifying and the race. Um, but I think it's really important to to have to use it to its potential as um, as you guys were saying it sort of brings you close to the drivers it makes them more humanized towards you so they kind of need to go hand in hand they can't they can't ex they need to exist together as, as one cohesive unit and a lot of a lot of a lot of fans in Formula E and in Formula One they are game players and I think that by playing these games it brings you close together obviously we don't have an official Formula E game. I, I don't think there's a market. I don't think there's a market for that yet. I don't, maybe in a few years, obviously, it's getting a bit more popular in South America and, and, place, and Asia and places like that. But it hasn't got the audience yet. But I think that by doing these race at homes um, every weekend, as though it was a Formula E weekend, it's, it's sort of bringing it's bringing attention to, to sim racing and to make sure that it's it's not made out to be sort of this afterthought it's not a virtual it's not just a game it's it's part it needs without without um virtual racing i think that racing in general would have suffered we wouldn't have had people people might have got really bored of it and i think that they would have and it sort of brought us all closer together. It's made us realise what, why we love racing, why we watch it every weekend. And I think that's what's more important than anything, is that. Yeah, I, uh, I heard a quote by former head of Nissan Motorsport and uh, current president of uh, Talk Esports, who run the race and the All-Star Series, Darren Cox. Uh, he actually founded GT Academy and ran that as well. And he, um, he made a point about the majority of motorsport fans nowadays are introduced to it through gaming. Uh, because like with me, for example, I remember, I think I played Gran Turismo 3. Um, and that was like my first foray into real racing uh, in a sense of knowing the cars and knowing how to drive it myself. And um, Aaron, I want to ask you something. Uh, it was an article I read on the race. Um, it was talking about how Lewis Hamilton, when he came into F1, he brought that multicultural aspect. He really brought it to a new audience in a sense of more people were watching it because they could re really relate to him. And they likened a lot of that to how Lando Norris is perhaps leading the charge of all these millennial Gen Z Zoomers who, <laughs> I cringe when I hear myself say that. Um, so, being able to, uh, with his Twitch streams, playing Call of Duty with basically I do work or Big Star One Two Three. Uh, those of you out there who don't know who they are, don't bother. Um, <laughs> they, 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 they were <laughs> able to really uh, put to bring this uh, world of racing, a highly technical, high, highly out there world of motorsport, to a new audience in such a relatable manner. I think he's a very important figure to motorsport now yeah i mean like i said earlier you know these streams are letting us see what these drivers are like behind the scenes you know that they do have personalities they're not just robots that get in cars drive real quick get some champagne and go on you know they do chill out you know enjoy themselves and it's like i said it's a bit more relatable because you know people can just sit back relax watch them you know laugh along with them and then when the real racing comes back hopefully they'll see, you know, Lando's racing again. They'll be like, oh, you know, I'll give it a watch, see how he does. You know, so it might bring more fans in. So this might have done a lot more of good than we imagined uh, originally. Because, you know, 
um, you know, Charles in the banana suit, it, it was a bit of a meme all over Twitter, not just in the F1 community, but, you know, people outside it was, you know, seeing it and, you know, it's, it's brilliant. It's just, it's fantastic. Yeah, and uh, um, just before we started recording, I do actually um, want to ask Rob to bring this up again. Uh, you, you mentioned, Rob, that you think that this, that the F1 virtual GP events, now, these F1 virtual GP events have been quite um, broad in a sense of the, the level of ability that we've had in there because whilst we've had Formula E and, and uh, NASCAR and uh, IndyCar and Aussie Supers getting in all of their drivers, F1 have only really pushed for like some of them to join in. But then in their place, they've had like a lot of footballers, some of whom we probably don't even look like they want to be there. They just, like in the last one, which was on Sunday, uh, what was his name? Um, I, 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 I Eric Laporte. Laporte, yes, that's him. He was just like at the back uh, by over two minutes, not doing anything. He looked, they looked like it almost looked like he had been brought in so quickly and he didn't have, he, he probably didn't care. Uh, I hope he did because obviously I want everyone to, but he, when you see these sort of uh, players, football players and other celebrities, like there was like Liam Payne in the first one in Bahrain. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they actually had any keen eye in on motorsport anyway, but when you have those people in what is supposed to be like a proper official event, it really undermines the, the, the level of ability we want to see, especially when you've got the pro exhibition guys just beforehand. Yeah, I think... On the one hand, you can say that it is nice to see a diverse group of people, not just racing drivers, coming in and taking part. But if you want to see that, really, you'd probably just say, "We'll put that on the not not the GP series because that's not, you know, I, I don't want to disrespect it by saying it's not a serious series, but it's not F1 esports. You know, it's uh, it was put in for a bit of fun whilst um, whilst obviously we're waiting for the for you know the on track racing to get underway. So I think really, if you want to get those celebrities in. Uh, obviously, they don't have quite the same platform as Formula One do, but you know you'd want to see that kind of thing in in the not the GP series rather than Formula One. I think just recently, you know, in the in the pro exhibition races, you know, we've had like Brendan Lee, who was a, a founding member of of F1 Esports, you know, the first ever champion. He's been winning races. Rasmussen's been winning. Jana Watmia uh, and Luca Blakely as well got his first ever F1 Esports win, and we didn't really hear about it because we're only really hearing about these celebrities that are coming in, and as you say, Luca, finishing last and, and not really being competitive, but they're getting a lot more traction than some of these F1 esports guys who, you know, don't have any sort of other fullback like these celebrities do, you know, this is what they do and they're not really getting recognized for it because of all these other kind of distractions. Um, so whilst it is good, you know, to see some new faces and I'm not trying to put a downer on it. You know, I think it's been fantastic to see, you know, all sorts of people coming in and like, for example, you know, when we saw Will and E and then not the GP series having, having banter with Lando, that was good to see. Um, and I, I think it's great fun and it has put a smile on my face, but it does just make me think of how it must be a, a bit of a kick in the teeth for some of these esports guys who have been doing this for a long time and all these celebs have come into, you know, to their kind of industry not been anywhere near as competitive as, as they have and yet they've been getting a lot more attention you could say such is life but uh yeah it's been a bit of a it's been a bit of a shame for, for some of those guys especially for people like luca blakely who you know got his first win and didn't really get the attention i think he deserved for it yeah and uh there was the i think it's the fact that these football players and these like we we only really saw in the virtual gp in terms of sim racing presence, Jimmy Broadbent for the most part, and only in the last one, uh, Tiamat Mardu. Um, mm -hmm. But and th these people have built their online. They're, they're not the people who surround them. Their fans, based upon the fact that they are racing, and but unfortunately, because racing is such a like a niche anyway, and then sim racing yeah. is even further yeah. niche. You've got then the uh, the fact that these football players. Who, uh, you know, the second you sign with a big club, you get probably about two million followers on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. So they they can't. They're just trying their utmost to get these people to to join in because, like, I I I'm so I'm such at odds regarding it because on the one hand, any more attention to the F to to you know these sim racing races, I I I think it's a good thing. But at the same time, yeah, it does completely and utterly undermine the 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 proper 
um, incredibly talented drivers that we see. Definitely, yeah. And um, I think I'm going to sound like a real nerd here, but I remember back in on like F1 2015, you know, the, the YouTuber Championship, it was Ben Daly, Ultimate Marduk, Arava, X Maddie G, and, um, and Noble 299, and then uh, Into the Barrier, or Scott, who was one of the first ever F1 YouTubers. He was involved as well in F1 2016. I remember, obviously, it wasn't the first time I'd, I'd watched those guys, but it was massive. It was a massive hit on YouTube. Lots of F1 fans, you know, if, if you watch F1 meme videos, you know, that they make an appearance every so often. Um, it was great, you know, to, to watch those guys play the F1 games and, and have some fun and, and do a, a semi-serious championship. But it was it was amazing fun to watch. So I think those guys coming in, it's brilliant, you know, to see that because, as, as you say, they've uh, their, their foundation is racing, you know. To, so to see them have the opportunity now, having given us all that entertainment and all those really good, you know, like nostalgic memories that we can look back on, and to see them now, you know, racing with with the likes of Charles Leclerc, Lando Norris, uh, is is it's it's amazing for for me to see, you know, having seen these small YouTubers who. You know, not small, but YouTubers who, you know, didn't look five years ago like they were going to be anywhere near, you know, the F1 paddock, for example. And they're now all, uh, you know, all successful and they've all been racing with uh, with these with these top guys. So I think for, you know, for them to be involved, it's it, it's really good. But it does, of course, kind of, as, as you say, kind of it opens the door a bit, you know, to a lot of a lot of other celebrities to to come in. So I think whilst it is a fantastic thing to see, you know, as you said, like YouTubers and sim racers who have built their careers on, on racing, you know, come up and, and compete at the very top. Um, yeah, sometimes with, with some of the celebrities and footballers who aren't into racing at all come in. Uh, as I said, it can be a bit of a kick in the teeth sometimes to these guys who have been doing it for a very long time. Uh, I want, at that point you made about, you know, meme videos. And uh, I, I do want to make a point about... Um, the digital revolution that seems to be happening uh, the, these days in many publications, like uh, something I've loved about meme culture and the sort of humour of people of our age group. Uh, I don't want to make assumptions about age here. Um, <laughs> but um, the fact is, is that we often decide what is popular. And as a result of that, we have, we, you don't see these companies deciding what the big thing is now. You see us dictating that because of the internet. And that's something I think Formula E did very well. Sarah, um, I, I remember watching, oh, it was great. Uh, I think it was like a, a video about, um, on Formula E's social media channels where they had actually edited the races to fit around current events, like with an upcoming movie release. So for example, I think the, the new Frozen film was coming out recently and Formula E edited a lot of races so that it looked like, like you know, the, uh, if the, you saw like a car spinning out randomly on its own, it would then like have, I don't know, some kind of reindeer shooting a laser of ice on the ground and then the car just spins. And I, that's something I've really loved about Formula E. It just seems to get young culture. And that's something that I think is very important to, um, to, to getting fans in for the future. Definitely. Um, they also did um, a really funny sort of skit where they did, um, obviously we have um, fan boost mode. And things like that and they they did it to, to match mario kart because all the drivers call it mario kart mode yep. so um but i think it's really important to to have that sort of influence on the internet because that's the way that news spreads these days it's no longer sort of in paper publications or or finding out about it on on the television a lot of the time now nowadays everything is on the internet so a lot of Formula E content is on the internet, um, including like um, YouTube. Um, YouTube provides a lot of the races um, and you can watch all of the races back to, um, back to back on the YouTube channel. So, and I think that's kind of what you were saying about um, it sort of drawing in youth. Um, a lot of the races that I've been to has been a lot of young people. And I think that by making it sort of um, making these memes and movie posters and things like that, it makes it more relatable because um, when I was growing up, um, Formula One was Formula One and motorsports were seen as sort of something that your dad would watch um, sort of or old men in garages. And I think sort of the new age of the Internet that's been brought in is bringing a sort of youthfulness to it and bringing 
bringing it so it's not just about people just driving around in circles and that sort of boring aspect of it but it's making it more relatable to the fans and making it about funny memes and things like that <laughs> Aaron Aaron there's a uh, something I, I want what Sarah just touched upon there about not just making it people driving around in circles something that I've really been able to latch on to with regards to a lot of um, motorsport coverage nowadays is that when you often see it through the eyes of someone who is very heavily invested in it it often feels a lot more likely that you will be able to find the energy to sap from them and be able to rejuvenate it with you to yourself so you that's why people individuals like Jimmy Broadbent and Tiamat Marduk and, and Matt Gallagher and, oh, and Into the Barrier like they're very important people in a sense of the way that motorsport is going nowadays. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, YouTube has blown up over the last five years. Um, you know, so a lot of people watch content on there. Like, you know, same at Marduk, he's nearing 500,000 subs nearly. I think Jimmy Broadbent's just about hit that. Um, you know, these channels are growing mass massively and incredibly at a quick rate. Um, you know, Arava does the My Driver series, which is like an alternate reality. You've got all these drivers who haven't had the chance to make it into F1 and they're in this game that Arava does. And it's compelling watching. You know, I watch it regularly and then, you know, it is really entertaining. Um, you know, and it is, I, I don't know, it's, I'll, you know, YouTube is just massive now. Um, not for just for the content, but F1 themselves, you know, they've jumped on the bandwagon doing these full race replays of classic races so it allows you know you can relive it or if you want alive to see it first time around you can watch it and see how it used to be how it has developed from what it was uh when regards to specific racing series oh, i could I, I need like mutated hands if i were to count on my fingers the amount of championships that have spawned from this so uh, the race All Star Series that they had their first event in on the weekend of the Australian Grand Prix. Max Verstappen took part, and it was a huge hit. And it's now spawned into its own like mini championships that are being held every week. In fact, currently, right now, uh, I think it was like uh, two months ago that they started making their own like little championships. They had like season one; it was like three races or three events, then a five race of season, and now this current one's like their third rendition. And they're doing Monaco, uh, the Indy 500, and Le Mans, or at least as close to them as they possibly can. And they've they've even gone as far as convincing legends of motorsport, like the likes of Emerson Fittipaldi, Mario Andretti, um, Fernando Alonso, Jensen Button, and Pablo Montoya. Um, so many of these people are now people. The last, the last, the last sort of people you would expect to be into motorsport. Uh, but, why am I saying into motorsport when it's into <laughs> esports? E esports, esports, my bad. Yeah, the last person, the last people you'd expect to be into esports are now do, doing that, and it's it is amazing to see. And I'm just, I'm just amazed that I'm from Stu Rob, like the fact that all of these drivers are now taken to the, the, the sort of things that they expect their grandchildren to do. Yeah, I think. Um... Well, w one thing I think a lot of the older generation, with with no disrespect, uh, not not all of them, but you know, a lot of them would would kind of they would look at esports and almost turn their noses up at it in a way, um, because it's not at the end of the day, it's it's not real racing, I suppose. But at, at the same time, you know, it is a it is a very good simulation of real racing, and uh, it it is still competitive, you know. So it is a it is a valid sport, really, and it's 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 becoming more and more valid. I think a lot of the guys that are taking part in it now, probably a few years ago, would have looked at it and gone, what the hell is this? I'm not doing that. But um, I, I think it's gained so much traction through social media, for example, that, yeah, a lot of the, the guys from from previous generations of, of racing have, have really looked at it and thought, you know, first of all, it's it's an opportunity to get back into racing, you know, especially whilst, you know, they can't physically go out and race now. And, uh, you know, and also it's, it's a part, it's an opportunity to be part of a, a movement in a way. Um, because I think, you know, you mentioned the, the All-Star Series when, for example, you know, F1 does go back to uh, go back to the track, you know, the likes of Max Verstappen and Lando Norris, 
you know, may not be able to be part of that championship as much. So it's going to give the opportunity to a lot of, uh, of other esports drivers now or potentially uh, legends to, to come back and do some more racing if, if they wish. So I think there's, you know, in the future when even when coronavirus is over, there's actually going to be a lot more opportunities for, as you say, the older generation of racers, but also a new generation of racers um, to, uh, you know, to come in and, and, uh, and and race you know virtually so I think the opportunities are there now and they're going to be there I think um, exponentially you know once once the coronavirus lockdown is over so uh, yeah I, I can't wait to see uh, how far this this goes because I think the possibilities look endless at the moment. Yeah I was that point you made there about the ones who probably won't be able to do it as often um, I don't see a lot of chances in the future for the likes of Norris and Verstappen and Leclerc, Albon and Russell to be able to continue competing in, in a lot of these events now because, you know, F1 as kind of has majority of its, well, not this season, obviously, because it starts in July, if it <laughs> even starts, but running from about March to, was it like November, December time, and they have like three months and they'll just be like, oh, can we not race, please? And, you know, maybe Norris and them lot might just still do racing in their own time, but to continue competing in like a very casual level, you know, just with each other, just for a laugh. You want to, you definitely want to be able to like detach from this action for a little bit. But then for a lot of these drivers who perhaps don't have as much of a, like a huge presence who perhaps don't have as much in the way of commitments, there's still a lot of avenues to explore in regards to like a winter series. Like Formula E, for example, runs uh, during like, well, when when you've got like most championships starting in the beginning half of one year and ending in the second half of that same year, Formula E does the opposite and it begins in the second half of the previous year, ends in the first half of the following. Um, but there is still a lot. There's still a few openings in there. Like even even not not just for F Formula E drivers, but like Formula Two drivers, um, IndyCar. Uh, especially IndyCar because they begin they end their season normally in August or September so they have like six months off typically yeah um, yep. but feeding into what's happening this weekend in fact just before we went live I read the news on motorsport.com there's going to be a virtual race of champions and that typically is hot that's held during the like well it used to be held in like the, the end of the year and then moved in 2018 to be in the beginning part of the year when there's as many drivers as possible who can do it and will do it. And it's, and it just it makes me think like, could we potentially see so many more of these races um, and events held during the, um, during the off season that could involve these people? And uh, I don't know who wants to take this, so I'm leaving it open to everyone, but could we potentially see a lot of these drivers compete even when they, they, they've got a lot going on anyway. Like, do, do they want to detach from the action or keep going? Well, I know um, some drivers who don't have enough super license points to make it to the next step, they do find winter series to compete in. I know there's one in Asia where it's like an F3 championship. You know, there's ones like that where, I don't know, they, ain't got, they just need a little bit more points to make it to the next step. So they can go to these championships, win them, possibly... And then, hey, presto, they've got enough points to make it to have an F2 drive, for example, or to be an actual F1 test reserve driver, should they be needed, you know? Well, I've got, um, I never thought about that, actually. Like, a lot of these drivers who perhaps don't have, you know, the best um, the amount of super license points will want to go and do these championships. So, it, it's, could we, like, provide incentives for these drivers to potentially compete? Because uh, this weekend, like I said, Virtual Le Mans, oh, and we have so many big name drivers in there, and it's just like, is is there a way that we could be be able to continue having these events with all these big names without it undermining their real world commitments? Uh, it's it's it, it's tough to it's tough to tell. I think, I, I mean, first of all, what what we can see as well is. It can work both ways you know you can see esports drivers coming into the real world for example i forgot what his name was but he came into to race of champions went up against lucas degrassi and beat him uh, and, and, and that's the one so uh yeah so he came in and uh, and beat a real racing driver so um i think it shows that sometimes it is pretty transferable you know so i think 
uh, that's an incentive, yes, for you know F, uh, racing drivers in the real world to um, you know to take part in virtual races, and, and and if they if they so wish during the winter season or the off season, you know, to go in and, and get some more racing done. But it also, I think, does provide an opportunity for esports drivers to go the other way and say, "Well, hang on a minute, you know, I think I can go in and, and, and compete against, you know, against the the big guys in in uh, in, in, in in on track racing." So, um, I think it's I think it's pretty transferable. Whether it would affect F one drivers' uh, commitments, it depends where they are career wise. I think, you know, a few years ago, obviously, we, we had Fernando Alonso when he was really getting tired of Formula One. He went to do IndyCar. I think if if there was a virtual thing going on there, uh, he potentially or somebody might have taken the opportunity to, um, you know, to, to go and do a virtual race. Probably not. You know, they probably obviously would have chosen the, the real life uh, Grand Prix. But you do see a lot of drivers, you know, like Nico Hulkenberg won Le Mans a few years ago. Uh, so I think it's definitely plausible to see, you know, F1 drivers, for example, that, you know, go into to other racing series. So uh, I don't see why, to some extent, you know, you you can't see them go into to virtual series as well because as we've seen, uh, in in both real life racing and esports racing, uh, they can be very competitive with each other. Yeah, well, like, oh, go on, Aaron, you go first. Like um, the point of racing drivers going into like esports and stuff. I mean, you've got um, John Eric Verne, he's the ambassador for Veloce Esports. I think Fernando Alonso has his own esports team. And I'm sure he's not the only one, but he's the only one that's coming to my head right now. Um, so, you know, they're sort of championing sim racing to an extent. They learn, put their name to it, say it is good, and then they can see how these sim racers do. And with the contacts they have, you never know, they might be able to put a good word in for them at a, a racing team somewhere and get them some real racing experience, possibly. Actually, um, Sarah, you know, regarding the Race at Home Challenge, that was obviously... Uh, from the very beginning, it was clearly defined as being having like you know a point system and a championship involved, and it ended up being won by Stoffel van Dorn, albeit in rather unfortunate circumstances because he accidentally tapped out as a result of being hit himself, uh, his championship rival Verline. Um, but do you uh, do you think that perhaps the key to uh, getting these esports events to happen in the future is don't put such a huge pool of money in, or incentive in front of it just wait for these drivers to potentially do it out of their own will because i know a few years i think it was 20 i oh know it was 2019 actually um lando norris and max verstappen with their esports team redline won the spa 24 hours on i racing and that that didn't count to a championship or anything uh definitely um with regards to the formula e race at home um, all of the drivers were sent um, a play seat, which um, they use in the e-racers. Um, some of them got them later than others, but um, we were we were told that it would be a, it's it was like a PR event, so they all had to be there. So they all had to be there at, at every um, at, and attend every race. Um, so I think the que um, to answer your question. I think it shouldn't be about incentive. I think it should be about whether the drivers want to do it because I think forcing them to take part in an event, although it was for UNICEF and it was for charity and it, it sort of brought, it sort of brought um, Formula E back to the forefront of people's minds um, by having a sort of professionally run, um, professional looking um, event with all of the drivers competing. Um, you sort of have to think, do they really want to be here? Do, do the drivers really want to take part? And if they want to take part, then they can. But then you have the problem of um, it, it's not going to be a real championship if all the drivers aren't involved. And that was part of the reason that it was considered a championship was because all of the drivers could take part. But then you have the problem of um, Formula E is one of the few series in which um, racing has actually begun and we are halfway through a championship season so what's the point in having a virtual championship when we have a real championship that's paused at the moment and could still potentially go ahead yeah because i think indycar and 
I'm not sure if the Aussie Supers. No, no way. The, the Aussie Super Championship actually, the E Series just ended today, and I think Shane Van Gisbergen won it. But yeah, with the did. with the IndyCar races, um, I'm not. I, did they actually score points for that, or was it just as simple as here? Let's do these professionally run races, but there's no championship involved. It, it is good. To, uh, obviously, there's there's no financial incentive but in terms of you know a championship incentive i think obviously sarah touched upon you know how they are doing like a, a mini formula e championship in the virtual world whilst the, the real championship is ongoing which is uh a, a little strange i guess but you know i think obviously in these very like extenuating circumstances i think it is good to to have uh you know a chat it's not like an official i don't even really think it, it will go towards like an official championship what they're doing virtually but it is good to, to kind of just run a little kind of I, I guess for fun but also you know out of competitive nature so it, it is a bit of a championship within a championship which to, to some extent yeah i can definitely see the point that it, it does seem a little weird but um you know they, they they've done the virtual championship but i think yeah if, if they get back under win the real championship I think the drivers, you know, they, they know how to differentiate the two and, and they know that that's the one obviously they'll be, they'll be targeting and looking at a lot more seriously. So uh, I, I think it's good, you know, to have virtual series. I think obviously once racing gets underway worldwide properly, um, as I said before, I think this will give rise to a lot more virtual championships for, for esports races specifically, uh, not just real, you know, not just uh, races from the, the real racing world. So I think this is almost like a precursor in a way uh, to a whole explosion of championships that the esports uh, racers can, can get into. Um, but at the moment, I think it works as it is, but naturally, of course, it's not going to work in the future. It's not going to be sustainable. It's also going to leave a little bit of a, a poor legacy, you know, seeing as esports has made such a, a, an appearance, such a prominent appearance on the world scene not just in formula one but in you know things like fifa uh, there was the Fortnite world cup last year and the winner who isn't even 18 yet got a, became a millionaire doesn't have to work for the rest of his life which is crazy but um you know you've got all sorts of things like that where esports uh, you know participants they've really you know mastered and they've championed this world so i think for for racers who with all due respect to you know to real world races you know they've come into this this esports world as i said before with with the uh, pro exhibition you know series races it kind of takes a bit of their shine away from them so for now whilst we're not racing in the real world it makes sense to to at the very least you know run a, a little mini championship or a, a championship just for fun in the future i think it will it will give it will give way to a lot more serious championships um for esports racing drivers and we've we've seen as well I forgot exactly which esports championship it was, but they were uh, they were present at the FIA gala last year. You know, Gran Turismo. That's yeah, Gran, Gran Turismo. So it was a, it was an official you know uh, championship series. I think now that this has happened with lockdown, now that we've seen a lot of real world F1 drivers and racing drivers around the world coming into these esports series and and taking part, it is going to uh, promote. A lot more of these series and i think a lot more official fia um registered series in the future with esports drivers and not real racing drivers so yeah it makes sense for now but definitely um it will change in the future which is a good thing i think that's a, a good note we can end on unless either of you two have something to pitch in uh, not, not like I'm, i mean apart from just putting a shameless plug in for uh, uh, virtual 24 le mans at weekend yeah, which uh, we are covering. Oh, I am chill moment there. I'm so looking forward to that. The, the entry, like the only thing about it now, um, there was oh, I was gutted when I heard that Jamie Chadwick had to pull out, but yeah. in her place, Robert Wickens, who will be, um, yeah, he's going to be great, obviously. But yeah, the the list of people they've got is incredible. I'm I'm worried now that when real world racing gets back on again, we'll never see a grid of such prowess between pro and sim drivers like, it's incredible but then that's part of the beauty of sim racing is that we can see that we you know a year ago for coronavirus would this have happened would we have had the likes of jimmy broadbent on the same grid as robert wickens for example in the same team i'm pretty sure um yeah they are actually you know, that that is the beauty of of this 
this rather unique 24 hours. I mean, next year's event will be back to normal, I imagine, if we if we are back to normal by then, hopefully we are. Um, so this year is a really unique opportunity for not just the rail drivers, but the sim drivers, you know, in an official 24 hours of, at, Le Mans, at Le Mans, you know. What I will say as well is just a, a massive like congratulations and well done to the people putting this this virtual race together um, because they've managed to to attract a lot of big names to this and a lot of a lot of racing drivers from around the world have, have, have come to take part in this virtual this virtual race. I don't know how the servers are going to cope. We'll we'll find out, I suppose. But um, you know, we obviously it's uh, it's it's a massive effort to get the the real virtual uh, the real uh, twenty four hours of Le Mans. Uh, probably more effort, obviously, than than it is virtually. But nonetheless, you know, with uh, with everything that's that's going on at the moment, um, it's really good that they've uh, you know they've managed to kind of find an alternative and and they've managed to improvise and and put together what is hopefully going to be uh, a really good Le Mans. Any ending note, Sarah? No. Okay. No. Okay. Well, <laughs> that is. <laughs> No, it's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Hey, I get to talk more. That's good. Um, <laughs> oh, my lungs aren't coping. Right. That is the pitcast, everybody. That is the episode. So um, thank you very much for listening to all of you out there. Uh, does everyone want to perhaps uh, plug their social media? Uh, Rob? Uh, yeah, so it's at Kershaw16Rob on Twitter. Aaron? Yeah, so it's at Aaron Erwin 7 uh, double A's in my first name. Uh, it's pretty hard to spell, apparently. Really? <laughs> well, I, I think we all just think that you're a, a, a Pokemon from Generation 3. You'd be surprised. Oh, yeah. The amount of spellings are impressive. Uh, all right, uh, Sarah, what about you? Uh, mine's uh, at Valentine's Kid, all, lower, um, all lowercase. I'm the oh. only one who doesn't have a first and last name <laughs> <laughs> no no actually i don't either oh no I have oh, do first name. no no in my first okay right that joke went very south it's the looper <laughs> format everybody um also uh my boss simon kind of wanted me to uh to plug the the our boss simon actually the the pit crow online's social media like we are on uh instagram uh are we on instagram i feel like we're not i, I might have yeah. missed I don't yeah. Yeah. we are okay oh yeah <laughs> Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, help me out here. <laughs> um, I've, oh, we are actually on that. Facebook, note, Facebook. Did I say Facebook? <laughs> we you said are, Facebook. We're, we're going to be, be on Spotify on, soon as well. Yes, yes. Thank you for taking the words out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll be on Spotify Sorry. very soon. So all of you on YouTube don't have to continue having the, the video playing in your, in your te desktop background. So, yes, thank you very all for all very much for watching. Thank you to my three lovely guests. They've done a much better job at this than me, at, the, at remaining professional. Um, we will see you out on track. <laughs>